Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Thanks for being here. We have a lot of people online with us today and a few people in the room, but I think more people should be coming. And we're super excited for this lecture today. There's a, probably a lot of visual, so it's great that people are watching online too. Um, if you're online, just the usual reminders from me, please make sure to stay muted, blah, blah, blah. But if you have questions or comments at any time during the lecture, um, feel free to put those in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat and ask your questions at the end of the presentation. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Bose, who's going to introduce our speaker and lectureship for today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, for those of you here and those of you online, um, I'm Marcus Bose. I'm one of the pediatric dermatologists here. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker today, Dr. Jenna Lester. Um, Dr. Lester came yesterday, or actually on Tuesday night, and spent some time with us over in the derm department as well. Um, and she and I actually met, we were a product of the pandemic because we both spent more time online on Twitter, and I'm like watching this person and admiring her from afar. And then I think we decided that I slipped into the DMs um, <laughs> and a positive response back, and it just turned into this, uh, you know, first sort of like an online friendship and then a phone friendship. And now yesterday was actually the first time that I met Jenna in person, except for a brief time when I interviewed you for residency. Oh, yeah. That, yes. So. Anyway, I bring this all up because sometimes we meet our heroes and we're disappointed. And let me tell you that Dr. Lester does not disappoint. She is an amazing um, educator and person. Um, and I just feel so lucky to have been able to spend the past day with you and today as well. So um, Dr. Lester is a graduate of Harvard College and the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. She completed her dermatology residency at the University of California, San Francisco, where she's now on faculty as an associate professor as well as the founding director of the Skin of Color program there. As part of this program, she's developed a clinical service, a curriculum for residents and medical students, and is building a research program. She enjoys teaching and sees it as a val valuable moment for building important dermatologic concepts, but also imparting information about healthcare disparities and how advocacy can play a role in mitigating these effects. And we were just talking about that um, on our way over here. You know, oftentimes people are told, like, go into primary care if you want to be an advocate. But no matter what subspecialty you go into, we need advocates um, looking out for our patients in all sorts of different ways. And so I'm glad that Dr. Lester is doing that in dermatology. Um, she was recently awarded the UCSF Medical Center's Academy of Medical Educators Teaching Award, which speaks to just how um, incredible she is. Dr. Lester's work in the Skin of Color program has been discussed in the New York Times, NPR, CNN, and many other news outlets nationwide. In recognition of her work in this realm, um, she was named a 2021 TED Fellow, a competitive international fellowship for thinkers and doers who have shown unusual accomplishment, exceptional courage, strength of character, and potential to create positive change in their respective fields. She's used this platform to continue to push forward the message about equity in dermatology. Dr. Lester serves on the American Academy of Dermatology's Augmented Intelligence Committee and is a member of the Skin of Color Society's Executive Board. And she'll be talking today about a very practical approach to hair and scalp exam in pediatric patients with textured hair. Thank you, Dr. Lester, for being with us. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Middle of it, I'm like, who's he talking about? Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, this is talking about hair is one of my favorite topics in general and also professionally. Um, and uh, uh, when I was, um, I think I was like a second year medical student trying to find my way and like what I was interested in. And um, for the trainees and for everyone in the audience, sorry, for everyone in the audience, you may remember when you started to become interested in something and you're trying to figure out like, how do I fit in and like, who do I talk to? And I went to a meeting in Miami for the American Academy of Dermatology and I'm like wandering around by myself. And I stumbled upon this panel discussion about hair. And I had no idea that hair was something that dermatologists dealt with. And this particular panel talked about, was um, a panel of all black women dermatologists talking about issues in people with textured hair. And they were, they were bringing clinical science and research to things that I had dealt with my entire life. Um, and so it was a very, it was a, I remember calling my, leaving the, in the middle of the panel, which I probably should have waited to the end because I was so excited calling my mom saying like, oh my God, this is like so cool. This is what they're talking about. And she was like, okay, I'm at work. Um, <laughs> um, but 
It was um, it was just such an uh, incredible moment. So it's full circle to talk about it here and to hopefully give you some tips that are helpful in your encounters with patients um, when you are in what is called by one of my um, pediatric dermatology colleagues, Candrace Heath, a hair discordant interaction. So when your hair is different from the person you're taking care of, how can you navigate? Um, I have the following disclosures. Um, but my content will not include discussion or reference of any commercial products or services, and I do not intend to discuss an unapproved, any unimproved or investigative uses of commercial products or devices. So our objectives today are the following, um, to identify important social and political factors that contribute to the context of textured hair in American society, to name important features of history and physical um, in a patient with textured hair, and then um, hopefully today is the beginning of an understanding of how to employ appropriate communication skills in this patient population. But of course, obviously all of this comes with practice. So I think um, starting out by defining what is textured hair, it may be a new, a new terminology um, that this is the first time you're hearing it described in this way. So textured hair describes the hair texture of people of African descent and um, and you know, many of these people may identify as black, some of them may not. Um, it's, a, it's not a homogenous group of people. And similarly, their hair textures can sort of range. And you can see here how um, the uh, person on the left has um, sort of more tight coils um, and in their hair and the person in the set, as compared to the person in the center who has a bit looser curls. Um, and I would say, the um, boy on the, the right has probably a, um, a, a cross in between, but also looks like he has some product in his hair, so it's a little hard to tell. Um, I think this terminology is important to be aware of, at least, because this is something your patients might be using, and it just lets you know, you know what exactly they're talking about. Um, this is terminology that's not even fully accepted in the dermatology world. Um, it's not validated. There isn't sort of agreement on what represents what. But in general, what, we that what we're referring to um, when we're talking about textured hair is people who self-describe as having 4A, B, or C hair. And what you see in the diagram um, on the right is a example of what an individual hair strand might look like associated with each of the different um, uh, hair numbers. So um, 4A is usually S-shaped coils, and it's a little hard to appreciate in this photo, but I'm remembering that this is a 3D thing, and so you can kind of imagine how these coils create sort of an S-shape in a, um, a three-dimensional um, space. And then 4B is more Z-shaped strands. Um, you know, on a clinical level, the hair just looks a little bit more tightly coiled and perhaps a little bit more dense. And then 4C is the most dense, um, tight zigzag shaped hairs. I usually refer to textured hair as coily or kinky. I never use the words coarse um, or rough because those have negative connotations and really me meaning wise um, don't really give you a sense of what's going on. Uh, I think coily certainly is um, a better descriptor and indicates what the actual hair um, strand is doing. So this is um, what I think pretty cool photos, um, electron microscopy photos of, um, it, of individuals with textured hair. And what this is demonstrating is uh, some of the propensity that textured hair has to form single strand knots, which you can see um, indicated by the arrows in the panels on the left. Uh, on, yeah, on the left and, sorry, letters K down here and over here. And then in the panels on the right in A and B, you can see those single strand knots as well. Um, you can also see uh, some fracturing happening, which, can ha which is more likely to happen in people with textured hair. And we can, we'll talk about why in a second. Um, and as a result, people with textured hair, on average, their hair is a bit shorter than, um, than people with straight hair. Um, and it's important to understand what's going on uh, because that, these, this really has implications on what treatments you might recommend for your patients and how frequently you might ask them to do those treatments. 
Here we see cross section of individual strands of hair and we can see um, all the way to the left uh, that the cross section of um, an individual who is Asian, their, their, their cross section is much more circular as compared to a more elliptical structure here um, in, in an individual of African descent. Um, in most of the other studies, and for example, the, the study on the previous slide that I showed you, um, they also found that Caucasian people who are Caucasian, their hair on cross-section is also rounder, but this one is showing a shape that's more similar to the person of African descent. So I imagine there's, um, there's variation here um, anyway, but this lends itself to a more fragile um, uh, hair strength. So between the single strand knots and the fracturing that we see happening, it sort of lets you know that um, um, people with Afro-textured hair need to be a little bit more gentle. Um, part of the reason has to do with this coily shape. So the sebum, uh, which is the oil in the skin, is produced at the level of the scalp. And it's very challenging for that sebum to travel down a very coily shaped hair. So that's why, for example, if you have really straight hair, you notice your hair gets oily after just maybe a day or two of not washing it. In contrast, someone with textured hair, it takes a lot longer. Um, but functionally, this has a really important role because someone with textured hair does not have that oil to lubricate their individual strands. So any sort of manipulation of the hair, washing it, et cetera, um, causes the hairs to rub against each other, which leads to that fraction, um, uh, fracturing and um, knot formation uh, and, and leads to a breakage. So I always joke that the fastest way to lose your credibility with a person with textured hair is to tell them to wash their hair every day. So if you're finding yourself thinking that that is something I might recommend for the condition I'm seeing, you should probably reassess, and now you have an electron mic microscopy view as to why. So um, in addition to understanding the form and the function that happens as a result of the way that textured hair is different, I think it's important to also understand the historical and social context of this hair as you're walking into the exam room. I was reading something the other day, and I can't remember what it was, that said um, um, black hair will always be political. And this is an example as to why that is. And there's actually several that I'll present today. But this, these, both these photos were taken in the 60s and 70s. And this was when there was um, growing popularity of wearing afros. Um, and this was a very conscious rejection of um, Eurocentric standards of beauty of wearing your hair straight. So there's a there's a very long trajectory of how different hairstyles that were in vogue for people with Afro textured hair. But this was a moment where people were saying, I'm going to celebrate my hair as it grows out of my head, as opposed to as the way that someone else says I should be wearing it. So here on the left, we see um, a group of uh, Black Panthers who were founded in Oakland. And um, I'm sure many people know were a big part of the black liberation movement and you know, did lots of things like invent school lunch and ran the first ambulance service and um, started WIC and things like that. Very, lots of um, positive contributions socially to society, but also were known for their Afros. Um, and so for that reason was very tightly associated with this political statement. Um, on the right, we have Diana Ross, who um, is wearing an Afro, and I believe this photo is from Vogue, um, showing how this was even in a more, quote, mainstream sense was accepted as a uh, you know, beautiful way to wear your hair. There's important social context behind textured hair as well. Um, and I think this is, to step back a second, I think this is important for you all to understand as pedi pediatricians, not necessarily because your patients will know about this at the time you're seeing them, depending on their age, they may, but this is these are things that their parents may be carrying or their caregivers may be carrying and in ways projecting it onto their kids or um, um, feeling it themselves and feeling sensitive about this when um, you're discussing hair with their, um, the, their child. So um, there was a study done that showed that looked at had photos of black women with textured hair, black women with straight hair, and white women with identical CVs. 
They um, circulated this among um, study participants. This was done at Duke um, School of Business. And they asked them to rate their professionalism and their likelihood to offer them a, a job interview. And they found that uh, black women with straight hairstyles were more likely to be viewed as professional and more likely to be offered a job interview. Um, so the, I think people pick up on this implicitly and explicitly sometimes are told by bosses that they need to wear in their, their hair in a particular way. And certainly, you know, if you look on Twitter around um, uh, the like match or interview season, there's always at least two or three medical students who are black asking opinions about how do you think I should wear my hair? And the responses are very interesting where you see people say you should just straighten it, like get in the door first, don't give someone a chance to judge you. And it's probably true, but it's it, even, even that understanding is uh, pretty tragic if you think about it. Um, it'd be kind of like telling someone with straight hair, you need to wear, you need to perm your hair and have a curly perm in order to be considered um, professional, which when you think of it in that way, it doesn't make sense at all. Um, in 2017, the U.S. Army lifted a ban on natural hairstyles. So your natural hair as a member of um, the Army was not something that was acceptable until 2017, which is very wild. Not that the Army is necessarily representative of policies that are not exclusionary and um, harmful to the people that serve, but this is yet another example. And then in 2019, the Crown Act was passed in California, New York, and New Jersey. The cr Crown stands for creating respectful and open, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. Um, and this is basically a law that prohibits employers from discriminating against their employees for wearing natural hairstyles, which means that in every other state that is considered legal. Um, so this is a bill that's currently in the United States Senate um, trying to, you know, just sitting there, as many of them do, um, hopefully making this illegal nationwide. So this is my plug for advocacy, in particular for um, my dermatology colleagues uh, who maybe see this as beyond, not in their lane, um, but we often see the negative and harmful effects of people using different styling practices that they may feel they need to because their hair is not acceptable. And so as physicians, I think we certainly have a place in advocating for a law that allows someone to exist in the way that they were born. So um, now we're at the actual visit. And the visit, a successful uh, um, exam of a patient with textured hair actually starts before the visit. This may not be possible for every, every practice setting, um, but is in an ideal scenario, you would talk, or be in touch with your patient beforehand and ask that they come with their hair in as close to its natural, natural state as possible so you can actually see their scalp. A lot of the pathology we see starts at the scalp, not all of it. There are hair shaft disorders, but um, even in looking at individual hair shafts, it's very hard to do that if someone has their hair in twists or in braids or if they have extensions in. So ideally, um, you want to come to your, you want your patient to come to their appointment with their hair in its natural state. And especially in caring for pediatric patients where someone else is likely doing their hair, this is a very heavy lift. And I'll go in a little, into a little bit more detail about what is involved in doing someone's hair and you'll see the time uh, that's involved in this. Um, so it's, 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 it's very important to be sensitive of this uh, in your pediatric patients. Um, it may involve, you know, someone taking their hair out. It may involve changing hair appointments around. Um, being considerate, considerate of this and um, knowing that parents, caregivers may not want to send their kid to school with their hair in a certain um, style. So if they need to take their hair out, they need to coordinate with their next hair appointment. Uh, and I think just having an awareness of that and asking patients about that and seeing if it's possible for them to take their hair down before they come in just transmits this, um, this sense of uh, understanding that I think is probably rare for them to get and is incredibly strong and important in building rapport. So I wanted to highlight some of the important history elements uh, in, in when you're seeing a patient with an issue uh, related to their hair. Um, of course, you want to ask all the all the regular things that you would ask for history. You know, how long has this been going on? Have you tried anything, et cetera? But with hair in particular, um, diet is very important. 
um, for kids of different ages, I think you all know better than I do that um, nutrition can vary at different times and um, and hair is all protein. Um, and I also like to explain to patients that hair is like an extra thing. Your body is doing this like for fun. So if you're under any sort of stress um, and you're not getting the food, uh, the nutrients that you need, it's one of the first things that it will sacrifice in an effort to maintain important like essential physiologic functions. But in particular, um, you know, protein several times a week. Um, I ask about, um, Vitamin D, because vitamin D is something that can impact hair cycling. So in, in kids who aren't milk drinkers or um, something like the, you know, other fortified sources that we know of, um, that could be an issue as well. Um, predisposing conditions like iron deficiency uh, can also have an impact. So low ferritin, ferritin below 40 can impact hair growth. Um, and interestingly, despite I guess I'm not really sure, I should have looked this up, but what the definition of iron deficiency in a pediatric patient would be. In adults, it's, for, it's a ferritin below 40, even um, if there's an absence of anemia. Um, but it's interesting that our lab values usually start at 12 as, as um, saying that you know their ferritin is normal. So for hair, for ideal hair growth, it would be above 40. So making sure to check even if it's not flagged as abnormal. Um, this is where things can get, um, where things get interesting in my opinion. Um, styling products are very, very important to know about for your patients. It can have an implication on what conditions you're seeing and, um, and counseling them about what they should use more of and what they should use less of in order to optimize their hair and scalp health, scalp health is really, um, hinges on knowing what they're already doing. And it can be really hard to, to know all the products that your patient is using. But I do think we have a, a bit of a responsibility, just like you have some familiarity with what moisturizers are good and bad. And, um, and you know, if someone has really bad eczema, you might suggest that they use Vaseline instead of just Lubriderm lotion. I think similarly, you should have some awareness of hair products. And this is the ethnic hair aisle at, I don't know, I think it's Walgreens, I want to say. So um, when I was younger, I had to go to the black hair store to get hair products. It's great that it's now in many of these more, you know, um, Target, Walgreens type stores, because we don't have to make a separate stop. But it's certainly at the end of the aisle, like in a separate section, usually in the back of the store, um, like right by the employee break room or something. Um, and you see these products and usually it will say ethnic hair care. I don't like the word ethnic because um, it suggests that people who do not have, it, it centers whiteness essentially. Um, so everyone has ethnicity of some type. So this is the textured hair section. Um, and you, there's lots of favorites on here. Um, and I think just knowing some of the names is helpful. So if someone says, oh, I'm using Camille Rose, like twist out butter or something like that, you were like, oh, I saw Camille Rose. Where's my pointer? Here at the store, right next to the mixed chicks. Um, and um, I know that Miel Organics right here has a really great decondition um, um, detangling conditioner. This isn't really that great right here because Dr. Lester told me they have a really great detangling conditioner. Um, if you if your patients are saying I'm using a lot of oils, um, maybe they're using something that looks like this. And you just have a familiarity with this. Shea Moisture products are very um, popular. Here we have Mane and Tail, which used to actually be a horse soap. And my grandma used it on my hair when it was a horse soap. I think it's now formulated for humans and it's not as good. Um, and, you know, there's, there's gels, um, and like, you know, gel stylers. If you've ever seen the baby hairs there, you, you know what that is. You see right here, we start to get into like some of the relaxers, like dark and lovely. And then you have some of the, um, brands that make all hair care products that make things that are specially formulated for people with textured hair. And they're usually like gold for some reason. I don't know why but here's Pantene. 
So, um, you know, I, as a dermatologist, I spend a lot of time in the product aisle and I'm realizing that that might be very specific to, to our uh, field, but I like go and look at lotions and understand how much prices are. So I know what I'm asking people to pay when I'm recommending they get certain things. And similarly, I stand in the hair care aisle just under w wanting to know what's new because I don't know everything um, that people are using. And I just want to understand like, what's the texture of the product? Interestingly, um, I did a review of like over 2000 textured hair care products available in Walgreens or Target or Walmart. We reviewed their ingredients and there's, uh, there's no fragrance free products. So if you have patients who have fragrance allergies or fragrance sensitivities, it be, it's very challenging for them to find products that might work for their hair. So, um, I do think we all have a responsibility for knowing these things. We learn lots of complex physiology. This to me is fun. And I think, um, uh, you know, stepping outside of what you normally do and experience is an important part of connecting with people who are different from you. So hairstyling history, this is also incredibly important and has um, implications on what hair loss conditions, someone might be, be more at risk for having. It has implications on how um, a person may um, style their hair or wash their hair. And, and again, like I mentioned before, um, has a bearing on how frequently you might tell them to do, do certain treatments. And this is another area where you may need some uh, education on what's going on. So someone may say, well, I wear my hair in crochet braids most days. Um, and this is what crochet braids look like on the right. And this is how they're installed on the left. You actually use a crochet tool, which you can see the person holding. Um, the, the, the person um, who's getting the style has her hair braided down in cornrows. Um, and the crochet tool is threaded underneath the cornrow and it pulls that twist underneath and through. Um, and then you loop it around and then it hangs down. And this is a style that um, I think is important to know just so you understand what they're talking about, but also is one that has uh, exerts lower tension on the scalp. So it's something I may offer um, to, to, to someone who feels like they want to be doing some sort of hairstyle with extensions as an alternative to something that may be more damaging to their hair or scalp. Um, these are box braids uh, and they're called box braids because of the shape at the base of them. And um, you just gather the hair and braid it. And some people add hair to this. Some people add hair without knots. Some people add hair by knotting the hair at the very base of um, the box and, and then braiding it out. And um, as you might imagine, you're grabbing more of the hair and more tightly. And so um, there's more of a risk of causing traction in this situation. So it's important to understand this hairstyle. Um, and this hairstyle forms the basis of um, faux locks, which we'll get to later. Um, these, are, these are locks, uh, regular um, dread locks. Some people call them just locks. And this is where um, you, some people use waxes or oils to get their hair to form these individual plates, so to speak. Um, and it's uh, this is one of the hairstyles that probably would be frowned upon in a workplace that um, was um, not under the auspices of the Crown Act. It's thought to be like unprofessional or something like that, but um, very popular hairstyle and um, causes, I think, only starts to cause problems when the locks get very long and they're exerting a lot of weight on the scalp, but otherwise you're not combing the hair, which is why it ends up growing pretty long. You're not breaking it like in those initial photos that I showed you. Um, faux locks, uh, to just show you how popular locks are, people who don't have them want to um, get them in a way that's more temporary. So, so locks are locks in this form are considered permanent. And if you ever want to get rid of them, you probably have to cut your hair. There are some good, there are some people who are really good at detangling, but in general, you probably have to cut your hair. Um, so the, these faux locks have become very, very popular. And you braid the hair in a box braid style, and then you use the hair, and instead of braiding it into the individual pieces, you wrap it around, and you get this appearance of locks, but that is only temporary. 
And then, of course, we have cornrows, which maybe you have seen in the past. Um, um, one of our favorite influencers, Kim Kardashian, said that she invented um, cornrows. Um, she calls them boxer braids, which we all know, Kim, you did not invent these. <laughs> um, so uh, these, these have been around for like centuries, possibly. And um, and I would consider a low manipulation style. Many of these are, um, and your patients may use that word, protective style, low manipulation style. These are styles that you can put in your hair and leave and not touch. And as a result, you're able to retain more length because as I mentioned earlier, any sort of rubbing or um, combing can cause knots and fractures in the hair and lead to the hair breaking off. Um, so. If you have your hair in braids, it's considered a protective style because the ends are protected and you're not needing to manipulate the individual strands every day. And then this is a, a weave. Um, a weave is where you, where you buy um, loose hair. It can, be, um, it can be synthetic hair or it can be human hair. And it is sometimes sewn into the, um, onto the scalp. So people braid their hair into cornrows like these and then sew the actual wefts of hair onto their scalp. You can have a quick weave where you use a um, wig cap and then glue these pieces on. Um, so all of these are hairstyles that your patients might be using. Uh, I generally see weaves in older patients, but I have seen um, quite young patients with weaves as well. Um, and again, a lot of this has to do with their since they're not in control of their styling, their parents and what their parents see as important and, um, you know, want their hair to look like. Um, and if you listen to the news enough, you always hear a terrible story. But there are several where um, teachers have sent kids home because they don't like the smell of their coconut oil in their hair and have them wash their hair. or They've cut their hair, lots of different sort of traumatic experiences that you can imagine parents are hearing or um, have family or friends that have experienced. So I think this is all important to take into account and to understand um, about your, your patients. Another plug for a great resource, which is YouTube. Um, if, if you have questions about any of these things or want to see in real time how they're installed, YouTube can be a very great resource to watch videos and say like, you know, I, I need to see how that crochet braid actually comes in. I find it quite interesting. I learn a lot from YouTube. You have to use caution because there is some misinformation and, and promotion of harmful hair practices. So um, we actually looked at a hundred YouTube videos, rep representative videos, look, um, talking about care of natural hair and um, through expert consensus decided on healthy hair practices and unhealthy hair practices. And many of the these influencers are promoting unhealthy hair practices. So it's good to know what your patients might be watching. I recently saw a stat that 90% people get 90% of their health information from social media, which is a little concerning, but um, at least if you're aware of what they're looking at, um, can sort of um, maybe counteract some of that misinformation. And then also it's just a good resource. Um, okay, so hair washing practices are very important to understand as well. This is a, a, a big time commitment. Um, I have just given you some timestamps of what a typical wash day might look like and asking your patient, what does your wash day look like? It can be a really helpful way of understanding what they do and how frequently they do it. You know, are you washing your hair every week? Are you washing it every other week? Um, are you washing it less frequently than that? Um, a lot of my patients come in and they have, they report that they're washing their hair every four weeks, every six weeks. Um, and I do think it's um, important not to suggest that a person with textured hair should wash their hair every day. But um, I usually recommend no less frequently than every two weeks. Um, and in an, it, it, when, I, when someone tells me they're washing their hair every six weeks, I usually like to draw the comparison of other parts of their skin on their body. Like, would you wash your arm every six weeks or something like that to sort of draw a comparison um, and, and suggest what might be more appropriate. But this is an area that you have to tread carefully because as someone who may, you know, wash your hair in 15 minutes before work, 
and without expressing that you understand how long it takes them, suggesting that they wash their hair more frequently, even if it is every two weeks, might be a lot. Um, so I usually, it's, for example, if I see someone with scalp psoriasis or seborrheic dermatitis, where it's important that they get medications or shampoos with keratolytic agents on their scalp more frequently, um, and they tell me they're washing their hair every four weeks, I usually invite them to um, to say what the, what the um, appropriate frequency they think it should be and um, what they think is doable for them. So I, I might say something like, you know, I think you should wash your hair every week. Do you think that's possible? Oh, no, I don't think I can do that. Do you think every two weeks is possible? OK, I think that's much more doable. And any sort of incremental progress that you can get in that area, um, I think, is helpful and um, in subsequent visits, they may see some improvement and it may encourage them to wash more frequently. Um, so this can take some time to arrive at. But um, remembering, um, oh, I don't think that this says my, um, there's a slide missing on this, I apologize. But there is, if you remember in 2019, I don't know if any of you saw that there was a, sh the um, Oscar winning short film was a short movie called Hair Love. And it was, it's six minutes long. It's on YouTube. You should watch it. And if you could watch it without crying, um, gosh, I don't know. But um, but it's it's a short film about a, a little girl and um, her father doing her hair. And it's just, the, the picture in the film speaks more than I could say. But it just, it, it really nicely, like beautifully displays the effort that it takes to do hair. And there's an overlay of family illness in there and what, what it means if a different, um, a different uh, caregiver is doing hair. So I think all of this provides context for how hard this can be and um, how much time it can take. Another small anecdote, when I was younger, I would go to my grandmother's house every weekend to get my hair done. It would be like a full day thing. Um, I would have to take my hair out the night before. I would go to her house all of Saturday. She would wash my hair in the utility sink with all sorts of like homemade accoutrements to like make it comfortable laying across her washing machine. And then it would, we'd have to take a lunch break because I couldn't sit for that long. And it would have to be like, cartoons would have to be, it's, it's just a very involved thing that now in reflection, I'm so happy we did that every week. I would not have traded that time for anything, but many other patients, people with textured hair, often black people have similar stories. So um, I think it's really important to know that um, this is going on in the background and it may be very different from what you experience. And so family history is also incredibly important. And you that may be intuitive, and I, I can't think of a situation where I wouldn't ask a family history, but just to make it specific about hair. Um, this is a condition called central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, CCC, CCCA for short. And these are, um, this is a, a, was a case series done in South Africa. Um, all pediatric patients, I think there were 10 of them. And um, this is a 16-year-old on the left who has a fairly um, severe case. And then um, I think it's a 10-year-old on the right that has a very subtle case. Um, the person on the right had no history of using any sort of chemicals or heat for straightening, wore her hair naturally, and still has some focal areas of scarring. You can see here and here. Um, and what was common amongst all of these patients, except for one, was that they all had a family history of similar hair loss. The one person who didn't have a family history actually couldn't be ascertained because they were adopted. But um, asking the parents in the room, do you have any history of hair loss? Does anyone else in your family on both sides? It's not just your mother's father. And what, there's some sort of lore about that person. Um, having implications on your hair loss. It's anyone on either side, all genders. And also knowing that people go go through extreme lengths to, to hide their hair loss. I've been in a room with a 13-year-old um, uh, girl with very early onset androgenetic alopecia, and then her mother, who clearly was wearing a wig um, and had significant hair loss, would not share that she had hair loss when I asked if anyone else in the family has it. So it's a very sensitive thing, um, and you may have to gather that information over um, several visits. So we're just starting the exam after uh, 
30 minutes. Um, I promise you that this is something that um, once you get the hang of it, it can happen in a much shorter period of time. Um, but I think this context is really important. So this is your patient sitting there and you wanna start the exam. Um, in addition to asking permission to start the exam, I would also invite whoever is there with them to take their hair down. Uh, and I think that's an imp important moment where you can see how their caregiver is handling their hair. Um, I watch this when, with, with my pediatric patients and my adult patients. And if I see they have tight elastics and they're like just raking it out of their hair and it comes out and there's all sorts of hair on it, um, I may not address it right in that moment, but I definitely address it after um, towards the end of the visit as I'm giving my, my assessment. Um, because... You know, it's it's important to see how the hair is being handled because, as we saw, the structure is very uh, delicate, and if they're they have all sorts of barrettes and bows and things in it, and there there's not care being um, given to taking that taking it out, that's instructive, um, but also an area of sensitivity that you just wait uh, be careful in too. I think it's also a good moment to comment on you know, how nice someone's hair looks and how much time you imagine it took to do that, that hairstyle. Um, ah, here it is. This is that in the right, in the place that I thought it was in. But yes, this is a, this is the um, hair love uh, movie. And this is after her father just did her hair that she tried to do herself from watching a YouTube video. Um, this, you should definitely watch this um, ASAP. Um, but it's a very cute. So it, it essentially just shows how long it took him and how much stress was involved in doing it. And I think that's important to recognize. So during the actual physical exam, um, parting the hair carefully so that you can see the scalp, but being very careful um, to, to make sure you're not pulling or tugging or breaking. I sometimes ask my patients, would you prefer me to wear gloves? Uh, some of them don't care. Some of them do. I'm almost always wearing gloves anyway, just out of habit. Um, I got points taken off on an OSCE because I was told my hands are cold. Um, so I'm still trying to outrun that medical school trauma. Um, you should have hand warmers in your pocket. What? <laughs> Anyways, so I've found that gloves sort of mitigate the icy cold um, finger situation. So I usually have them on anyway, but if I don't, you know, I may not. I'd certainly wash my hands before in a way that people can see. And then I sometimes ask them because some people prefer that. Um, and you want to examine the frontal hairline, the occipital hairline, uh, the posterior auricular hairline. Uh, all of these can can display pathology. And this, this person has a rat tail comb, which um, I could see that being a useful tool in an exam setting, but then it brings into question, how do you sanitize that between patients? A reasonable alternative is using those long cotton swabs. I find that the pla ones with the plastic handle are better than the oh. ones with the wooden handle because the ones with the wooden handle have just enough like like friction action that they tug at the hair and um, it can be uncomfortable. Uh, looking at the eyebrows and eyelashes is important as well. Um, you often will see hair loss in, in the eyebrows and eyelashes in conditions like alopecia areata. Um, and I wouldn't ask about hair washing uh, techniques or frequency, et cetera, while you're looking at the scalp. Um, of course, whenever we're in a setting like this and we're talking about the like, perfect way to go through things, how often does that actually happen? So sometimes I realize I didn't ask as much about shampooing practices as I wanted to, but while I'm looking through the hair is not the time I do that. I usually wait till the exam is over and I sit down and ask further questions because that's a moment where they can't see what you're doing and you're looking in their scalp and then all of a sudden they're like, do, am I dirty? Are they noticing something? So just save that until the end if for some reason you didn't get to it before hand. So here are some general tips that I think are helpful um, uh, in, in communicating. I generally don't tell people that they can or can't wear a certain hairstyle. Hopefully, hopefully by now you understand um, the immense context around hair and the sensitivity that you should be taking and how someone may be engaging in a particular hairstyle, not necessarily because they want to, but because they feel like they have to, or just because they really like this hairstyle and they think it's pretty so um, um, or nice or whatever. Um, it, and so 
for you to suggest to say you can't do that, it can be, I think it can be perceived as kind of harsh. What I typically do is I use a, a sort of harm reduction approach and say, well, I see you really like cornrows um, and I think that's fine to do, but maybe we, maybe you can make them a little bit looser so that we're not pulling at your hair. Or um, maybe your cornrows can stay in for one week instead of two weeks so we can make sure we're getting a wash in so we're controlling your seborrheic dermatitis. So I think that um, there's really nothing all good or all bad. It's all about trying to find the balance for your patient depending on what they're going through. Um, I don't and hopefully this is just a general practice, but I like to say um, outright that I don't implicitly or explicitly blame people for their hair loss. Uh, and I think I have, I've witnessed many um, situations where that may not have been the intention, but you can sort of see the crestfallen look on someone's face when they're getting signaling that perhaps they did something to cause this. And certain, like I said, certain hairstyles or practices are more harmful than others, um, but Given the context, it may not be something totally intentional on the part of the patient. Um, I think it's also very important to recognize that not everything, um, not all hair loss in a black patient is traction alopecia. That is a very heavy anchor that I see used a lot. Um, and traction alopecia is loss at the edges of the hair as a result of tight hairstyles. So there's sort of this assumption that someone with textured hair may always be using tight hairstyles. I had a patient who came to me very upset because she was told she had traction alopecia, even though she informed the doctor that she always wore her hair in its natural state as an Afro, never has worn braids or pulled her hair back. Um, and I think this Go, um, lends itself to this overall narrative that we know to be true that certain people are believed when they come to the doctor and other people are not. So if someone tells you they've not worn um, tight hairstyles, I'm not sure why you wouldn't just believe them. And it turns out this person had a completely different type of hair loss that had nothing to do with traction. Um, and yeah, I, I, what I've said over and over and just want to reiterate again, Acknowledging how treatments you might be recommending um, may impact typical styling practices and inviting the patient to share whether it may or may not be possible to um, undergo the treatment that you're recommending. Um, this is uh, something that one may misdiagnose as traction. This is actually alopecia areata. And just to underscore the point that even hair loss at the hairline um, can be something else. And referral or biopsy, depending on what setting you're practicing in, um, is almost always appropriate if you're unsure about the diagnosis and it doesn't fit with the history that you're being given. Um, so in summary, there is a deep social and political history to hair that your patient may be bringing with them to their appointment. There are many different textured hair products and styles, and I think it's all of our responsibility in order to know more about patients who may have practices different from ours to learn about some of them. Um, hair washing in practices in patients with textured hair are different than in patients with straight hair, uh, and not all hair loss in black people is traction alopecia. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a lecture I wish I had had earlier in my career, but I'm really happy to have it today. Um, there's lots of people online, so if you're online, feel free to chat with me, and I will read your question out, and then I will look to the room. Oh, lots of people in here now. <laughs> Everybody's like three minutes late. There's so many people. If you have a question, let me know, and I'll bring you the microphone so that the people online can hear it. I have a question. Awesome. Um, Jenna, I was wondering, you know, I hear a lot in derm and gen peds that things like detanglers and straighteners that they're a lot of the chemical components can be endocrine endocrine disruptors mm. um and just wondering if you have a take on that how much you talk about it with your parent with your patients of all ages mm -hmm. um and how that informs any recommendations that you may give um yes yeah, so um the this is a this is a really important question and i think an area we're still learning more about, but there are some studies that various people argue the strength of the methodology of that have shown that um, the chemicals and relaxers may cause like uterine cancer or may contribute to increase um, in fibroids. Um, there was a recent study that looked at parabens and 
and um, an increase in breast cancer in black women. Uh, so I think that there is evidence and um, the threshold, I have, a, I have a complicated relationship with evidence, I think in terms of making recommendations to patients. Because I think in some ways, um, data is a bit of a violent structure because we use it on people who are not even represented in the creation of that data. So as I'm telling you this and about to say, you know, I'm not sure there's enough data to support it. I also am not sure that this is an area that's investigated enough and the data that we have is suggestive. So it's something I share with patients, um, uh, you know, relaying that we need more information uh, and that this may not actually be something that bears out with bigger studies but I certainly direct them to the information to show them where it exists. Um. I think we're almost out of time, so if we, can, if we can let everyone go back to their day. Thank you so much, Dr. Laster. Yes, that welcome. was really, really important information for all of us. And thanks to all the people online who are here with us too. And I know you have other places to go. You're going down to Odessa Brown Clinic next. Yes. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks,